Low River family, thank you so much for joining us again on this special Sunday morning as we just continue to worship the Lord, continue to remember His resurrection, and we continue to allow Him uh, to transform our minds so that we can love Him with our minds. Just a few things we want you to know about. Uh, first of all, most of our groups have now ended. There's a couple that will still be going on. You can go to our website, theriverabilene.com, riverabilene.com, and you'll be able to get information there. A uh, couple of things also going on. Uh, Love and Care Ministries, a local ministry that helps uh, those in need, is in uh, great need of donation of men's clothing, especially men's shoes. So if you have any of those that you'd like to donate, you can bring them here. We'll make sure that they get down there uh, to that amazing ministry. June 24th, save the day. Put this down. It's going to be an amazing, amazing one-day retreat for the River family. So if you're part of our River family, we would love for you to be a part of this. Um, John James, who was the original lead singer and founding member of the Newsboys, will be with us. He'll be sharing. His wife will be leading the worship. It's going to be an amazing, amazing day. It usually begins around um, uh, 9, 8.30 or 9, and ends somewhere around 3. We'd love for you to be a part of that. And as always, it is a great opportunity to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, no matter where you are. You could be in another city, another state. It doesn't matter where you are. You can advance the gospel of Jesus Christ through the mission of the river by giving. And there are three different ways that you can give. You can give uh, by mailing a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas, 79602. You can give by secure text at 84321, or you can give uh, by going to our website, theriverabilene.com, theriverabilene.com. Go to the drop down, and you'll be able to give there securely. Love for you to do that because of what it does for you and also what it does for the gospel. Here's a question. Talk amongst yourselves. What percentage of the brain is water? And what percentage of dehydration does it take for people to struggle with uh, focus and short-term memory and other cognitive skills? What just slight percentage of dehydration does it take before that happens? Talk amongst yourselves. We'll see you in a minute.
return to you again. Lord, let me burn for you again. Let me return to you again. Say, God, God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart till I am a soul on fire. Lord, I'm longing for your ways. I'm waiting for the day when I am a soul. Welcome back, River family. So are you wondering about the percentage of your brain that is water? Well, it's 73% water. And if you just have a 2% level of dehydration, you can lose focus, struggle with your memory, and have other cognitive deficits with just a 2% loss. This is a powerful, powerful tool, isn't it? Powerful tool. Let's see how your mind's working right now. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Here is a little brain teaser for you. It's Einstein's brain teaser. A man stands on one side of a river, his dog on the other. The man calls his dog who immediately crosses the river without getting wet and without using a bridge or a boat. How did the dog do it? I'll give you a second to think about it. Time's up. Let me ask you again. A man stands on one side of the river, his dog on the other. The man calls his dog, who immediately crosses the river without getting wet and without using a bridge or boat. How did the dog do it? Apparently only 2% of people can figure this little riddle out. It's Einstein's riddle. Here's the answer. The river is frozen. Make sense now? To make your mind work a little bit, hopefully your mind is beginning to train in on what's most important. Let me give you um, a, kind of a quick review. Back 
Um, in Mark chapter 12, we learn that Jesus begins to add uh, to the Shema. It is love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and your mind, or heart, soul, and your strength. And he adds the word mind, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, your news, and strength. So the objective of Christians is to actually engage this thing to love God. Now here's, here's the interesting thing. I think it's probably the most challenging thing to love the Lord with. It's a lockbox. It's a vault. It's a, it's a bastion of privacy. It's the, it's the final frontier. And we have to let the Lord intervene in our minds and begin to change them. That's the second thing that we learned is that Jesus post-resurrection was able to open the minds of the disciples. That means he opened their ability to, to reason and have logic, their ability to meditate and ruminate on things, their ability uh, with their imaginations. And so when God does that, when the Holy Spirit does that, opens our minds, it's better, it's better and, and, and more powerful than being open-minded. It's better to have the Holy Spirit open our minds. Then we begin to engage God in new levels, higher levels. We understand Him. We have a higher love for Him. We get bigger pictures of the kingdom that way. And then last week we talked about the fact that there is a, um, a fleshly or an unspiritual mind. It's a mind that just kind of caves in on itself and becomes focused on self. And the more focused on self we are, the more we kind of naturally begin to gravitate toward religious exercise. So if you do certain things, then you must be right with God. It becomes a very prideful thing. But then when we fail in those, we, we begin to add new ones. We begin to feel guilty. We get to add new ones. And in our guilt, sometimes we even look down on others for not fulfilling a religiosity instead of relying on what Jesus did for us on the cross. Full sufficiency in the cross of Jesus Christ. And we can't let anybody take that from us. And if we ever dive into religiosity, our mind is beginning to um, filter down into a mind of an unspiritual nature. And we don't want that. We do not want that. We're going to talk about a second condition of our mind that we really want to avoid. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our souls, open our bodies, but most of all, open our minds to the largeness of what you can do and who you are. And Lord, I pray in this moment against a corrupt mind and for a mind trained on Jesus. And as for me, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. All people said, Amen. Hopefully you said, Amen. If you have a Bible, we're going to what they call the pastoral epistles. And we're going to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, we're going to read the last sentence in, uh, well, we'll be in chapter 6. And we're going to read the, uh, read the last sentence of um, uh, verse 2. And then we're going to continue in through verse 10. 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in the last verse of verse 2 all the way through verse 10. Let me give you a little bit of background. Um, Timothy, uh, is he's walked with Paul for several years. He's a young pastor, if you will. Uh, Paul has done a lot of downloading with him. It's written in about 65 uh, AD, and... Um, Timothy's now sort of over several churches. And this letter is probably written while um, uh, Paul was in prison in Rome for the first time. So he has a lot at stake in relation to this. And he has a high heart of a spiritual father not wanting the body of Christ to falter and to fall into heretical hands um, in places where minds have been altered in an undue way. So with that in mind, let's... Let's read the word. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. And he details that above. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching. Let's just stop there for a minute. Let me define that. We find that by now there's probably already a written gospel. So they have in writing and verbally what the gospel is. 
the story of Jesus, the story of his redemption, the story of forgiveness by faith, the story of of being made right with God Almighty, the good news of Jesus Christ, it is written down, and you don't want to alter that. Listen, theology is important. An understanding of Jesus is important. The Scripture, the Bible, is important. And it's important that we know it so that we don't drift. He's saying don't drift from that original gospel. That is the Word of God. And he continues, If anyone teaches otherwise, do not agree to sound instruction, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to godly teaching, they are... Mm. Here comes, beloved, a laundry list. They are conceited. Conceited. Meaning that they are excessively proud of themselves or vain. They're conceited and understand nothing. The picture is sort of void of what is really important. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words. There's a a pseudo-intellectual group that loves to sit around and take a word that everybody knows the meaning of. It's not from another uh, uh, language. They're just sitting around and arguing over this particular word because they're trying to bend it for self-interest. And they sit around and they quarrel. That's this particular group. And it says that these quarrels about words that result in, listen, listen, that result in envy, envy, which is a resentful discontentedness, in strife, which is a bitter disagreement, envy, strife, malicious talk, which is wanting to do harm to another, kind of like gossip talking behind Malicious talk, evil suspicions. Those are suspicions that develop a, a, uh, an undue, evil, frightening paranoia. What are they saying? What are they doing? Evil suspicions and constant friction. You know what friction does? It creates heat. They use this word in the English because it's a picture of People arguing and bumping up against each other until there's great emotional heat. So we just saw that they're conceited. And then we find from that conceit, they leave a trail of damage interrelationally within the body of Christ and with others. So so you're following? These are the people. This is what they're like. They're, They're very... They're very uh, conceited. They really like themselves. They're, they're, they're very uh, devoid of actual uh, knowledge and that they've left a trail of damage behind them relationally. These are not people you want to go hang out with. Well, who the heck is Paul talking about? What gets people in this particular kind of condition? And it's this. He goes on to say this, in constant friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth. Of corrupt mind. It's the mind condition that you don't want. A corrupt mind. This causes these very conceited people who leave a trail of damage relationally, and it's all caused by a corrupt mind. Now let's look at this real quickly. Diaphthormenon. And now what this means is to rot thoroughly, corrupt mind. To ruin, corrupt mind. To decay utterly, corrupt mind. Figuratively, to pervert, corrupt mind. To thoroughly corrupt, corrupt mind. It is a rot, a decay, a perversion of this. 
very conceited, lots of damage with others. It's a mind condition when you think of rot or corruption or decay or perversion. It's a, it's a mind condition that does not happen overnight. It happens over time. So think about this. Those that struggle with this particular condition, a corrupt mind, are people who have gained this corrupt mind over time. And all of a sudden their mind has a new condition that is causing them to be conceited, to be argumentative, to do damage interrelationally. And the seat, the root, is a corrupt mind. A mind that ain't right. A mind that ain't right. This one guy, he went to the doctor to discuss with him his issues with short-term memory loss. So the doctor immediately made him pay in advance. His mind wasn't right. Or when you realize you got two lobes with the brain, there's, there's the right and the left. And the left realizes there's no right. And the right realizes there's nothing left. It's a mind that's just not right. It's slowly decayed. It's slowly perverted. It's slowly rotten. Now... The biggest symptom of a rotten brain is this. Go back to the text. He says, these are people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth. And then he talks about their behavior. And who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Let me unpack that for a minute. It means that Those who would use their reverence or even a religiosity to advance themselves through gain. This is financial gain. The the NIV actually adds the word financial so that you understand that this is specifically about gaining wealth, money, esteem, all this sort of stuff. By gaining financial wealth by acting as though you are reverencing God Almighty. Now I know where your mind went. You're probably like, this text doesn't have a lot to do with me. Come on now. You just sidestepped in your mind, because I'm a mind reader right now. You just sidestepped and went to a corrupt televangelist or a preacher that you read about that had his hand in the till. You immediately sidestepped and it was difficult for you to take this text and this particular body that he's talking about, this group of believers that he's trying to encourage Timothy in, you, you sidestepped it. It's really easy to go, oh man, but you remember that guy back in the 80s and who did this and took all this money. You have all that going on in your brain. But what if you read it like this? That a corrupt mind, people with a corrupt mind, are willing to take the principles and the, the, the great grace of the kingdom of God and slowly pervert it into a usefulness for the kingdom of me. Are you with me? You're like, well, I've, I've never told somebody to send in a tithe and then took it and went out and bought a boat. I've never done that. Neither have I. But here's the interesting thing. It's about a systemic understanding. These people whose minds are corrupt have turned things to the point where they are now operating in a, in a reverence for God, in a sort of a faux reverence of God, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that they can gain something. Sometimes... We go to our knees and we pray prayers that reveal a corrupt mind. 
We pray prayers that match the agenda of me, not the agenda of thee. It means our minds have the beginnings, at least, of some rot, some decay, some perversion. When we kneel to pray, when we engage our God, it is one of the best tests to determine if we have a corrupt mind, if our prayers follow the agenda of ourselves or the agenda of the kingdom. Like this little boy spending the night at his grandmother's house in the room right next door to her. His mama goes in to do prayers with him. He starts praying out loud. And he says, Lord, give me a bicycle. Lord, I really want a bicycle. And his mom said, sweetie, why are you talking so loud? God's not hard of hearing. He said, oh, I know, but grandma is. That subtle slide, remember I told you the rot, the perversion, the corruption, it's not, it's not an overnight thing. It's when we take this amazing gift of what God Almighty has done through Jesus Christ, transformed our lives, draw us into a relationship with Him, allows us to know God intimately, takes that and we begin to pervert it and to begin to move our theology, our understanding, our, our agendas, our goals, slowly slide into the agenda goals of thee, not thee, but me. Just consider the content of your prayers. Sometimes when I hear people saying, I'm praying for a breakthrough for me, I cringe just a little bit because I'm like, I hope that is for thee, not you. Because it's a sign that the mind has got a little rot beginning, a little corruption beginning, and we don't want that. If we're going to love God with our minds, we don't want that rot to begin in us. So consider the content of your prayers. Consider the agenda of your study. Consider the motivation of your worship. And if it ever slides to the kingdom of me instead of the kingdom of thee, then guess what? Your mind is beginning to get a little nasty, a little corrupt, a little perverted. Now, Paul, in Pauline fashion, lays out a little bit of an antidote right after this. Let's continue in the text. Verse 6, he says, but, but. So he says, they use this for a financial gain. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he gives commentary on that particular verse. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager, eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. You can't take it in and you can't leave with it. So it's not useful for the kingdom. He says this really simple antidote, but godliness with contentment is where the gain comes from. So if you don't want your mind to do the slow slide into rot, decay, corruption, perversion, if you don't want your mind to do that, you start with godliness. And here's the godliness uh, uh, understanding. It is not perfect behavior. It is passionate pursuit. It is a high reverence for God that leads us to want to perfectly love Him. When we pursue God passionately, intimately, drawing into a deeper relationship with Him, that's the first step. He says, godliness, reverence, pursuit, passion for Him, coupled with contentment. And contentment is 
to be satisfied or to feel complete or to feel sufficient, to feel spiritually complete. Now listen to this. Resting in the sufficiency of the Savior that you're getting to know with your reverence, with your godliness. You see, one of the greatest understandings of where our mind is is a strong believer who's pursuing pursuing to get to know the Lord and is coupling that with being very satisfied in that relationship is someone who doesn't need gain but uses gain for the kingdom. There's the automatic difference. You see, lots of people need stuff, need money, need things. But whenever we don't need those, that's when God will allow those. Because he says this, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, when we don't need stuff because it's not essential to a kingdom life, that's when God would be willing to allow us to have stuff because then we take the stuff to become a tool instead of a point to be pursued adored, worshiped. This word for gain, perismos, it means stuff, money. It means a spiritual depth of gain. You see, the believer that fights against a mind of corruption is a believer that passionately pursues and is satisfied in the sufficiency of that relationship and doesn't need stuff. In that stasis is the opportunity for God to bless so that stuff becomes, gain becomes a tool of the kingdom, not a God to be adored. adored. You see, the people in this church were Pursuing gain by using the gospel. Now that seems harsh or weird because it's like we don't really do that. But I think if we look at the, at the content of our prayers, we just might be doing that. People who have a mind that is not corrupt can pray this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. You see, the corrupt mind can't pray that earnestly. Or maybe this prayer. Let me be your servant under your command. I'll no longer be my own. I'll give up myself to your will in all things Lord, make me what you will. I put myself into your hands, fully into your hands. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Those are risky prayers, if they seem profoundly risky to you, some of the rot 
of corruption may be entering your mind. Do you want to love the Lord your God with all your mind? Then I encourage you to passionately pursue and to be content in the sufficiency of that relationship, needing nothing else. And at that point, God can bless you so that the kingdom may continue. You see, the heart and the mind that is not corrupt can say, let me suffer or let me be healthy. Either one is fine because I'm sufficient in you, not in my surroundings. So how's your mind? Do you find yourself um, struggling subtly with a corrupt mind? By using your faith, using your prayers, using your study, using your worship in ways that are hopefully beneficial to your kingdom not his. If that's happening, I just want to encourage you to stop. Turn. Passionately pursue. Have high reverence for Jesus and the gospel. Realize that's all you need. Your mind needs to be convinced that that's all you need. And then the tools to find his gain just might come after that. Know that you don't need them. They're just tools. We do not want to be conceited people with a string of damaged relationships behind us that fall into the capacity of using our love of God for our own agenda. We want minds that are passionately pursuing, that are content. Let me pray for you. Lord, um, each of us struggles with allowing ourselves to have some rot, some decay, some perversion in our minds. And the Lord, sometimes we allow that to enter into our love of you. And Lord, for that we are truly sorry. We stop and we say no more. I pray that you would impassion us to pursue you with all that we have, to give you the highest point of reverence and love. And Lord, in that depth of our spiritual walk with you, May we realize we need nothing else. Let us be comfortable in that truth. And then, Lord, at that point, if you choose to give us stuff for the kingdom, we will be willing to let it be a tool, not a guide. So, Lord, I pray against right now the corrupt mind. And I pray for a mind trained on Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, 2% dehydration can affect your mind. A little 2% deviation from the truth of the gospel, the real gospel, could begin a rot in our brains and cause us to actually use our faith for our own personal agenda. Let's not give in to that corrupt mind. Let's be passionately pursued and content. We'll see you next week.
Tower.